with the professional VMware.com V Brown Bag US edition. Today is Wednesday, February the 26th. It is 7.30 p.m. Central. And uh, here we are tonight with uh, Mark Gabrielski. Uh, he is at Mark Gabs on Twitter. He'll be talking about home labs. Uh, a few notes before we get started. Uh, follow along uh, and get in on the conversation using the Twitter account at the Brown Bag or the Twitter hashtag the Brown Bag. Our other global podcast Twitter accounts are the at the Brown Bag Latam and at the Brown Bag EMEA. Uh, we've got a number of, of different uh, Brown Bags that run around the world. We've got Asia Pacific, EMEA, Latin America, which is U.S. speaking, and the U.S. show, which is this one. You can always go to professionalvmware.com forward slash brown bags uh, to uh, get the links register, et cetera. Uh, John Harris should be joining shortly as a, a, a co-host. Hang on one second. Again, uh, my name is Damian Carlson. I am at Six Foot Dad on Twitter. Our guest tonight is Mark Gabrielski. He is at Mark Gabs. And uh, with that, Mark, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and uh, just you know introduce yourself while I make you presenter. All right. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Gabrielski. Um, I've been practicing uh, computers and general IT as a career for about uh, 20 years uh, and uh, virtualization since about 2001, where uh, we ended up with VMware Workstation. Uh, so one of the common things uh, that I've been asked always is as people are getting started with this or they want to uh, go ahead and build themselves a lab environment is how to actually go ahead and do that. Uh, so I developed uh, this short presentation um, and it has some complimentary videos and some great things that will go with it. Um, but really the point of this, uh, creating this entire presentation and this parts list, uh, one, I still love to tinker so it was great to go ahead and put these components together. Uh, but I really wanted to build something and give uh, someone the framework to build a home lab that you can do networking, iSCSI, NFS, uh, run uh, not only VMware as a hypervisor, but all the hypervisors, and then still inside of those run VMs just like you would in a, uh, in a production ESX iServe. So we take advantage of some nested ESX as well as keeping things uh, very inexpensive with that $2,000 type budget. Um, so. Uh, one of the things is uh, I, I do this presentation um, in front of a lot of folks. Uh, you can find a lot of complimentary videos that I'll mention on my YouTube channel. Uh, and it'll actually walk you through a lot of the configurations that we're going to describe here. So really, to, to keep things on a $2,000 uh, budget for someone to go ahead and build and develop a home lab, uh, I was really trying to focus on a few things. Running uh, Intel VT to run 32 and 64-bit hypervisors. I wanted a Layer 2 and Layer 3 capable switch. Uh, I wanted a, a storage solution that could provide both NFS and iSCSI uh, for my lab environment. And uh, as you see, uh, the total parts list there was created back in November, but it was still over the $2,000 budget. And that was that last line item there, that Lantronic Spider. Uh, for any of you who work with Dell or HP and you use your ILOs or your DRAX, uh, that Lantronic Spider is exactly the same thing. We'll show you how that works and how that goes together in this home lab. Um, but I don't, I don't read out the parts list, but you can see I've, uh, I've given some uh, pretty lengthy numbers there that are pretty easy to search through. And uh, you can really put together this home lab system. Uh, so how, do we, how does that all end up going together? We'll show you that. But then the software that we're essentially using is all looking to be free. Uh, ESXi free, uh, and again, if I run ESXi on my server hardware uh, that I'm going to drive my lab with, I can run virtual machines that are ESXi, Hyper-V, or Zen. And inside of those, I'll still be able to run 32 and 64-bit VMs when I nest that. Um, and ESXi, sometime uh, in the last year, uh, removed the 32 gig RAM limit. Uh, for my lab environment, uh, 32 gigs is how much we put into the server, uh, but it's just nice to know that you don't have that 32 gig RAM limit in, uh, in case you have some other hardware that you'd like to use. So, um, and if you're running all evaluation software, we're not looking to run this stuff long term for production. We're looking to build it, tear it down, rebuild it, get comfortable with it, and practice things. Uh, so, using evaluation software is 
really in your uh, what we're going to end up looking for. <coughs> Excuse me. So wanted to kind of give an idea of how I was going to be putting this this solution together. So on the bottom left we see the back of a shuttle PC. On the uh, bottom right we'll see a Synology LAN uh, 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 Synology storage device that I, I chose for this. Um, but really what I wanted to do is put this on my home network and uh, create as little impact as possible on that home network. Um, so we all have our Wi-Fi routers and our, our central uh, our central access points at home, whatever they may be. Um, I wanted to put that switch in place and then abstract everything behind it with different VLANs. Um, and the switch that we chose is going to be able to help us do that uh, because it is a layer 2 and layer 3 capable device. Um, really when we start walking through, uh, this is what my home network looks like today. Uh, and uh, as I start building it, building out and integrating that first component, which will be the switch that we talk about, we're going to end up giving out VLAN IP addresses. Uh, and it, essentially the complimentary videos that we show you will actually walk you through the build process and, and how this all goes together. Um, but this video that you can always refer back to that they're recording here on the B Brown bag, you'll be able to sit back and uh, revisit these slides and um, the, two, the two videos together will be a really good complimentary step-by-step uh, -step on how to put this together. Because as soon as I go away from my existing home network, I start adding all the other VLANs that the switch will be capable for you'll see that I'm really segregating out and trying to mimic as much as possible you know, the segregated VLAN environment that uh, my office might run. Um, so not to harp on this for too long, but I really wanted to segregate out the different uh, types of traffic into their own broadcast domains and still have uh, full communication between them. So that's where I came up with this particular switch model. Uh, you may find others. I was really looking for something that uh, was very inexpensive. I ended up picking up uh, picking this unit up for $150. So that's pretty inexpensive for a layer two and layer three device. Um, its limit there is 32 static routes, but other than that, it's, it doesn't have any fans. It sits on your desk. It doesn't really it doesn't create any noise or white noise. It's great. Um, and then as you start going ahead and uh, wanting to take advantage of some of the more advanced features, they all exist inside of this this switch. The only downside to this switch, it's 100% web managed. So uh, it doesn't give you the CLI experience, but it does give you all the features that you'd be looking for. This is really what it looks like uh, when you go ahead and you start logging into the switch. Uh, and essentially, you can go ahead and do some of your basic device configuration. Um, you have some of the more advanced authentication, so you don't have to have user accounts managed on the switch itself. Uh, you can do some security and QoS uh, components, but really where you'll spend a lot of your time is here in the, uh, in the network section. And uh, as you can see, uh, I've already done the configuration here, uh, and it mimics the, uh, the table that we saw earlier with how I was going to go ahead and break up my VLANs. Um, you can see I've gone through and assigned VLAN interfaces, so that way the switch knows how to, uh, which IP address to use as its uh, default route for all these other subnets that I'm going to go ahead and create. Um, and here is where you would go through and actually do the definition and configuration of your ports and what VLANs that they'd be able to go ahead and access. So uh, you can see I have ports 3 through 6 and they're all being tagged, uh, which means I can pass all those VLANs down, that, uh, down those ports. And you can see I also have some that are in my home network uh, and some that are in the iSCSI and NFS networks. Really what the switch gets you, uh, that yellow cable up front is a grounding cable, and for home labs we'll probably throw that out. We have rabbit ears, power cables, rubber feet, uh, and that console cable. Um, so that's really what you get for that. Uh, when you plug your console cable in, and you're going to go ahead and uh, configure that, uh, you need a serial port. Uh, those are the configuration parameters uh, for Hyperterm or for uh, PuTTY if you're running Windows 7. Um, and uh, if you don't have a serial port on your laptop, there you can easily grab a USB to serial uh, converter, and that'll let you get through uh, that hardware limitation. Um, essentially, though, uh, you go ahead and you can get that switch all uh, configured. Uh, and one of the videos that I mentioned earlier that's complimentary to this is a 20-minute or so walkthrough of the configuration of this switch 
and how, how to configure it. And we use that table and uh, the example that we've been looking at here um, as the basis for that video. Um, sorry. And uh, so even though you might configure that initially and have it map out the way I had in, that, uh, in the graphic earlier and match all the tables, you might find that if you put devices uh, out on the other VLANs, they might be able to ping out to the internet, but they're not going to really be able to browse or surf. Uh, and that would be because your home, home router does not yet know how to send traffic back to those devices. Um, so setting up some uh, static routes on your home switch will do it. Or you could do some simple route add commands from, uh, from your workstation as you were going out and trying to work with it. Depends what you're trying to do. But uh, I don't cover that in all the great details because it's really difficult to cover every possible variation um, of a home router and how to set up static routes. Um, but essentially, if you use that uh, VLAN 1 IP uh, as the next hop, uh, you should be in great shape. Again, so we're coming back to this, this graphic. And uh, now that I have a switch that's configured and manageable on my home network, um, I want to start building out some of the other components behind there. So the next thing I'd like to do is, is start to work on that shuttle. That would be that bottom right device. And uh, I'm really going to work on the, uh, that iSCSI VLAN port, that red cable. Um, initially, I'm, when I was doing the configuration, I might put it out on, my, uh, uh, on port 2 uh, on my home network. Uh, because to configure that device initially, you need to be in the same subnet or broadcast domain. Uh, to get the configuration tools to work. Um, and that gets covered in the uh, another set of complimentary videos. Um, but this device was chosen. It lists at $600, so again, it fits uh, in that uh, low-cost budget. You can run it with one hard drive, up to four hard drives, again, depending on what your budget allows. Um, has a couple of great features, and uh, it's uh, all the hardware support for Microsoft and for VMware hypervisors. Um, and it's a pretty cool little home lab. It also runs very quiet, um, sitting there, uh, sits, sits right there next to your, uh, your, your computer, doesn't really uh, create any white noise. And I keep focusing on this quiet aspect of the home lab. Mine is sitting right next to the computers that we're looking at, uh, that I'm uh, doing this, uh, this go to meeting with right now, and yet you don't hear all the fans work. So it makes it a pretty nice environment for me to continue to work in. Uh, just a couple of things. There are drives um, that you could add in this that have been validated and tested. Um, I ended up using uh, two terabyte drives during my first iteration of this. Um, I, per I moved myself up to four four terabyte drives um, from the same uh, uh, NASware devices. Um, so the Synology, just like VMware or Microsoft, has a hardware compatibility list that they've tested and validated. So I went and stuck with that. <laughs> Excuse me. So, again, this set of uh, action items on how I went and configured the switch, uh, the Synology initially. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it, whether you want to switch VLANs and network ports or whether you'd rather move a cable. I just picked this as it was the simplest to explain. It doesn't mean it's the only way to go ahead and uh, address this. Um, and, again, there is another set of complementary videos that are out there. Uh, this one I think is also about 20 minutes long, and it covers the initial build, configuration of the Synology, um, the presentation and configuration of NFS shares, as well as the uh, presentation and configuration of iSCSI shares uh, or volumes uh, for my ESX server environment. Um, and again, just to reiterate that unless you've set up your home uh, routers to go ahead and have static routes back to your VLANs in your home environment, um, you may have to do uh, some route add commands to get back uh, out into the, uh, to the Synology to manage it. Uh, <clears throat> so we've covered the switch, we've covered the uh, Synology, and Really, I want to jump into that luxury item now. As if I'm building these components together, I had to build the uh, that Lantronics Spider device uh, before I could configure my ESX host. Um, what's tough to find this kind of device? There's not a lot of them out there for the uh, white box market. Um, but I was really trying to mimic what I get from an ILO or a DRAC as far as uh, remote access, and more, most importantly for me, the remote media feature being able to have an ISO on my desktop that's presented to the Lantronic Spider for installation. Uh, otherwise, I would have had to include CD-ROMs in, uh, 
uh, ESX host. So it's a small device. It's kind of pricey, um, but again, you got mounting clips. Uh, the device is pretty simple, and it comes with a console cable for its initial configuration. Um, if you look on the picture on the left, you have an Ethernet port. It's uh, 100 meg link, um, and uh, that cascade port is so you could have multiple spiders connected uh, over one uh, one gig link to your upstream switch. Um, but cascading is something uh, a little outside the scope of today. Uh, picture on the right is really uh, the only time you'll use that serial port is when you're doing your initial configuration. And uh, the device actually has an auxiliary power right uh, on hidden almost behind that, uh, that video cable there. Uh, the way the Lantronix gets its power is from its two USB ports. So if your server is down, uh, you, you have to walk up and actually hit the power button on your server to get, uh, get it powered up. And then it takes about a minute and a half, two minutes before the spider actually uh, is ready to utilize. And the spider is 100% web-driven interface, uh, runs with a little bit of Java. And uh, again, the entire walkthrough of this, there is another one of those complimentary videos on that YouTube area that does the configuration of this and, uh, and the consumption of this device. So pretty straightforward. It took me all of about uh, 10 minutes to actually configure it. And uh, the first time, it took me about 30 minutes to configure it. Um, and uh, there's that example video and you'll be able to pull that up uh, at your leisure uh, after the session. So now that we've gotten all of these devices all configured, the, uh, the last item uh, that we have is that shuttle PC. So that shuttle PC has got one, uh, uh, one physical processor in it, but it's got four cores, um, and they're hyper-threaded. So technically, eight logical cores are available in the box, and uh, it has 32 gigs of RAM. Um, so, and it's a, all these devices are really small. So when I look and stack these devices up here in my home lab, it's about a foot deep by about eight inches across um, by about 18 inches tall, and that's my entire lab environment. Um, I think the best, uh, best investment I made when I did this was a bunch of one-foot patch cords, uh, and that helped me keep things uh, really clean in the back there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, talk about that shuttle PC. Uh, so part of that parts list was an internal drive. That way I could uh, have some space there to load up my uh, initial ESX operating system. And I'll have some leftover storage to, to build out my virtualized ESX I hosts. And we'll be building on the screen here um, as we go through it. So um, what I would load on the actual shuttle PC initially was ESX 5.1. And then I upgraded right away to 5.5. And uh, just like the bullet calls out, that Realtek driver, which is the onboard NIC in that uh, shuttle PC, in 5.5, there's no driver for it. So I didn't feel like learning to make custom ESXi ISOs. Uh, and uh, that was the path of least resistance for me. And uh, once I went ahead and installed ESXi on there, uh, I now had a fully functional system with a standard vSwitch. Um, so uh, how do I configure those vSwitches and get the system prepped for the next component? Uh, there's a few pieces of prep work, uh, and uh, the first major bullet there is talking about if you're using something that's less than ESX 5.1. Uh, I'm talking here about 5.1 and 5.5, so why even include this? If you have older equipment um, that's available to you to run your lab gear, um, never hurts to know what other functions you need to do to, uh, to make it possible to run ESXi or Hyper-V as a uh, VM and still running virtual machines. A couple of things that I would not do in a production environment would be the, the way I configure the uh, virtual switch uh, security settings. You have to allow promiscuous forged and MAC address changes in order to allow uh, the nested hypervisors to work correctly. And uh, you also have to create a, a port group called trunk. It's actually when you when you look at your VLAN list, uh, you can actually when you in the pull down it actually calls out all 4095 just like that. Um, and what that allows the nested ESXi servers or the nested Hyper-V servers to use is VLAN tags, just like you would have on your physical hardware. Um, and as always, you got to make sure the uh, Intel VT is enabled in the BIOS. Um, and Shuttle put that together a couple of years back. So uh, even though we do want to make sure our BIOSes are up to date, even if you ordered something like that, it would it would come in up to date with the uh, with that capability. Um, so. <clears throat> when I was building my uh, that physical shuttle uh, and configuring the uh, initial vSwitch zero, 
I only have two NICs in my hardware. So I had to go ahead and uh, mix all of that type of traffic right there on that V-switch. Uh, I only drew one line, but you could go ahead and you could do teaming of the uh, physical uh, uh, shuttle PC. Um, no issues there. Just have to make sure you have that trunk, which we'll go ahead and use when we build virtual ESXi hypervisors. Um, you can see that the shuttle PC is on that 69 subnet, so it's actually on my home network. Um, and I actually have created a 69.0 VLAN 1 uh, virtual machine port group. So that way, if I needed machines to run for my on my home network, I have it there. So now that we've built our physical uh, ESXi host, the next step is to go ahead and build a VM that's going to run ESXi or Hyper-V or Citrix Zen or Rev. Uh, but I'm focusing on ESXi, and we're going to go ahead, we're going to create one virtual ESXi server initially. Uh, so still out of the box, VMware doesn't make it surprisingly easy to go ahead and build a new VM as an ESXi host, but it's not that difficult. Uh, so there's a few steps, and we'll go through them really quick, and there's the configuration. So you build a new VM and configure it as such. Um, depending if you have 5.1 or 5.5, you can have either 4 or 10 network cards in your virtual ESXi server. You only really need a 4 gig hard drive, um, and that mimics the 4 gig SD cards or USB sticks uh, that we put in our uh, servers uh, in our data centers. Um, <clears throat> just be, be wary that uh, I'm sure some of you have been bitten by this already. Uh, if you do go ahead and upgrade to uh, your virtual machine to hardware version 10, so you can get the 10 NICs that uh, are provided. The only way to manage that virtual machine is through the web interface. It's kind of a catch-22. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're going to go ahead and build these uh, virtual hypervisors, uh, whether you want to use hardware version 8, 9, or 10. Um, some, things other, some things that you have to do and some things that I like to do, uh, I remove the floppy because it's unnecessary. Uh, you have to point the CD-ROM to the install media. Um, <clears throat> Once you've built the virtual machine and then edited settings, you can then go to your guest OS uh, and then tell it it's an ESXi5 virtual machine. It's actually a supported guest operating system type. Uh, some of the other things I do is uh, I disable logging because I don't need it for uh, my lab environment. And uh, inside of the, e inside of the uh, VMX file or through the advanced configuration parameters, you want to throw hypervisor CPU ID V0 um, and uh, that v VHD enable. You want to put those in there. Uh, I suggest using PuTTY to do that as uh, that VHD enable line. When I was running it on 5.5, I had uh, quite a few issues uh, entering that line in the GUI and it not taking. Um, I finally got down and put it in via PuTTY, uh, just editing the, uh, the VMX file by hand, uh, and I had no issues. Um, that being said, this is a lab environment. We're supposed to go ahead and you know challenge our comfort zone, so getting familiar with the VI text editor shouldn't be that much of an issue. And some of the last things that we have to do is you have to go in and edit some of the CPU ID masks. Um, the specifics are listed out there. Um, and uh, the in, uh, Intel VT, uh, you have to go ahead and enable that specific uh, virtualization uh, feature. Um, and that will allow you to, to run not only the ESXi, but allow that ESXi server to run virtual machines that are 32 and 64 bit. And this is going to be true. This whole process will be true for whatever hypervisor you'd like to run. Uh, so that being said, at that point, I like to keep that virtual machine so I don't have to go through this uh, lengthy configuration process every time. It's uh, you know very easy to make mistakes typing out some of these advanced settings there, uh, specifically the CPU ID mask. So at that point, I just clone it. Uh, <clears throat> once I've cloned it, I can go ahead and I can configure multiple ESXi servers uh, that are virtual machines. Um, so I'm going to take it to the next step and talk about um, how I would configure the networking in my nested ESXi hypervisors. And again, depends on the version of uh, hardware that you're using, whether you have four NICs or 10, 10 potential NICs that you can use. You can see that I'm still trying to mimic uh, um, management and vMotion on one uh, vSwitch, all my block level traffic, be it iSCSI or NFS, on another pair of NICs, and then all my VM traffic segregated out on its own pair of NICs as well. Uh, and the details of those configurations depend on how you, you're trying to build out your lab environment. Uh, but this is just one example of how to get that done. And if you can see that this virtual ESX server, or the nested hypervisor, it's actually you, all these NICs connect to that trunk port group that we configured on the physical ESXi server. 
And then that way we can use the VLAN tags here in the nested ESXi server, just like we would do in any uh, production environment. Um, once that's done, I can go ahead and I can provision, provision network access to block level storage via iSCSI or NFS. And more importantly, um, above and beyond that, you can still run all your virtual machines on top of that environment. So if you're, uh, whether you're looking to pass a VCP, practice something for your, uh, your work uh, in a segregated lab environment, in other words, not damage production, take your pick for whatever reason, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and uh, again, there's a complimentary video, and I can actually drop out of my uh, presentation and uh, show some of these, uh, this web interface and some of the other components that are complementary to that. Um, just one thing to remember uh, as we put this whole environment together, it's to run ESXi on the physical hardware uh, as you build your lab environment. Even if you're going to go out and learn some of the other hypervisors. Uh, <clears throat> if you try to run Windows 2012 R2 on the hardware, it'll run beautifully. It runs really smooth. But then you can't run virtual machines that are ESXi servers or Hyper-V servers and then run VMs inside of them. So really it's ESXi free and then all your other hypervisors can go on top of that. That being said, uh, that's the, the meat of the presentation, um, and uh, just wanted to go ahead and show a couple of other components uh, outside of this presentation. And uh, hey Mark, this would be, go ahead. Would you mind if we pause here to see if anyone has any questions? No, that'd be, that'd be cool. That'll give me a chance to breathe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man, you're going very fast. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. I was trying to keep yeah. it within a half hour time frame you guys gave me. Oh, no, no, it's a full hour. All right. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm taking a look at Twitter. Uh, Kel and Dan has a question out here uh, asking if anyone has used a Cisco SG310 or a D-Link DGS 1100-08. Do you have any familiarity with that, the, the uh, Cisco or the D-Link switches he's mentioning? Um, not those specific uh, makes and models. Uh, Again, the switch the switch models particular uh, wouldn't really be uh, the thing that I would be concerned about. Um, if you're going to go ahead, I just picked an HP switch because I had one floating around my desk my desk in the office. Uh, if you're going to go ahead and look at any of the other switch vendors, just just look for the things I thought were important. I wanted layer two, which every switch should be able to do, but I wanted to be able to have layer three routing in the switch itself. Uh, what that would allow me to do is to keep things simple from the networking perspective uh, and have all my routing out on the switch rather than having to create virtual machines to enable routing. Uh, I've done that in the past as well, um, and it is possible to do it that way and have a, a virtual machine be your router. Um, but I was trying to uh, take advantage of the switch hardware and that layer 3 function at that point, at that physical device. Cool. Uh, Graham Mitchell just sent a comment uh, here within the webinar that uh, he uses that Cisco switch and uh, that it, it works well in his lab, although he said that there's no uh, 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 link aggregation, though. Uh, hey, Josh Atwell, I see that your hand is raised, but I can't send you a chat probably because you're on a, a tablet. Do you want to be unmuted? Uh, I'm going to unmute you, so stop yelling at the kids. Hey, Josh, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Hey guys, right on. Yeah, kids are already in bed. Uh, I was just going <laughs> to chime in that uh, I also use the SG300 switch. Uh, it is not, uh, I guess, the uh, absolute most feature-rich switch, but what I did find that for the lab, the price point, the port count, and you know, being able to have managed VLANs, it you know it, it serves pretty well. I, I have the 300-10 currently. I'm kind of been angling for the 20 port after a lightning strike, but uh, yeah, I just haven't haven't bit that bullet yet because it is a little bit more money. Yeah, and everyone's going to have a different price point that they're comfortable with and the port count that we can get to. So when I was building this, I was focusing on yep. uh, being as frugal as possible. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I was when I went with the ten. Um, you know, and naturally I went with Cisco just because my uh, my background with networking was I was very comfortable with Cisco. Um, you know. Uh, oddly enough, I worked at Cisco at the time. Did not get a better discount from Cisco than I got on Amazon, but these things happen. Yeah, that's kind of the way it goes. 
Uh, I was incorrect earlier when I said that uh, the Cisco doesn't do the link aggregation. Uh, what, what I should have said, and, and, and thanks, Bram, for correcting, is that it doesn't do multi-switch aggregation. Uh, so yeah, um, I bought a cheap little, what is this guy? Uh, cheap little Netgear, like a little eight port switch. Works just fine in my lab. It's it's not a 10 gig, there's no row management, but it's like 60 bucks. So uh, it's super low end. Uh, and I know that that's outside of Mark's reference architecture he's got going on here, but uh, mm -hmm. there's there's a wide range of of good switches out there with, with various features that you can get a hold of without breaking the bank. Um, yep. Yeah, and I'll, I'll throw one thing in because uh, and I've been meaning to put, put a post up on uh, professionalvmware.com about this. I started it, haven't finished, about the kind of transitioning and, and you know, stepping into a larger, more dedicated lab. You know, how can you get started with workstation and, and, and move on to a, a more dedicated lab? Because that was kind of my path. And one thing that I ended up kind of, I wouldn't say I, I, I painted myself in the corner, but since I had everything running on my desktop, when I brought in the switch and started purchasing hosts, you know, I had my virtual workload mix between running workstation on the desktop and working on the new host that I was bringing, it, bringing online. And what that ended up doing to me is I, I wasn't really taking full advantage of VLANs because then I was going to have to you know, monkey around with workstation and, and you know, do all, it was just more complicated networking than I wanted to put time into. So you know, that's one thing you're going to want to consider and think about when, you know, when you're gradually building up your lab if, if you're not willing to make that you know, $2,000 to $2,500 upfront uh, investment. Yeah, I was really disappointed when I started um, looking into building out a lab. I, uh, you know, here in my home, that, that there isn't any sort of feasible, you know, kind of on-demand cloud solution uh, available for for home lab folks. You, know, you can't run it on AWS. There is bare metal cloud, which is a fantastic option, and they and you know they've they've supported the uh, V brown bags for you know for a good long time. They're great. It is literally what it, it sounds like. You can spin up a bare metal server, and you know they can even pre-image some things. You get. Uh, uh, you know, remote KVM or uh, uh, the the Dell Direct Access, etc. Uh, the only kind of downside for my own use case is that you have to leave it on all the time, uh, or you know, you basically have to image it off, power down your box, and then image it back on again. And that just wasn't, you know, that didn't really fit well within my my work schedule of uh, you know random VMware lab time versus something that I can actually sit down and focus on uh, on a regular basis. So, yeah, <laughs> my my biggest piece of advice for a home lab is don't have crap storage. You know, spend the money on a Synology or, you know, what have you. Make sure that you've got good storage. Uh, that was kind of my downfall there is I was running on some, some uh, you know, kind of consumer grade NAS stuff and it just wasn't enough juice, and I kept having a number of issues uh, with the VMs that I had on there. So I ended up kind of giving up and found another option for a friend of mine. But uh, you know, definitely don't 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 skimp on the storage. That to me was uh, you know the most important thing that I noticed. So, so Damien, one thing that you got to also watch out for, and I got burned on this last spring summer working on mastering Vsphere five five book is that uh, if you have a storage issue and you lose all your virtual machines, if you don't have a backup, you're rebuilding. And that sucks. So, yes, indeed. Yeah, that's, indeed that. that was one of the things that I took into account here as I'm building out this, this lab is this is that physical shuttle PC with that. Uh, I put a four terabyte drive in that. Um, and it's running a couple of VMs, not consuming quite uh, that much storage. Um, but. Uh, my next uh, build will be a uh, going to be doing VDP uh, as well as uh, Veeam and loading that on there, just so I have it on separate spindles, a backup of all things that would be running out on that uh, that SAN device in my home lab. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, I had a question here. Where did it go? From Sean Massey. What are your thoughts on using used hardware such as uh, off-lease gear from eBay? 
absolutely no problem. Uh, we all know that you know used hardware is uh, got its quirks, but for the most part, it's treated uh, most of us pretty well. Uh, the thing that I would see there is that it's going to probably go above the budget that I, I was trying to set, which is to around a two thousand dollar. But again, if you have that luxury, if you can afford it, and you get a great deal, uh, I would say absolutely go with that. Uh, but uh, again, I was trying to be frugal when I as frugal as possible when I created this. Uh, for the lowest lowest common possible denominators that are out there, right? And money is usually not something we all have uh, too much of. Yeah, uh, you know, even if money weren't really that big of a concern, I uh, used to have a job a while back where I was a, a, a pre-sales engineer, and I had some of our kit, it was an actual appliance, like a, a 4U rack-mounted appliance, as well as a number of servers, uh, servers, geez, servers and a 10-gig switch. And even though they were just the uh, little super micro one U two server guys, those things were wicked loud and hot, and uh, you know also a little bit of a power eater. So, uh, you know, if you're going to buy something off eBay, it'd be awesome if you get server hardware and you had the budget for it. But you also got to remember the noise and the heat and the power. Um, you, yeah, <laughs> you, you bring up noise, and uh, I, I brought it up earlier. Uh, I'm running. Yeah. Old this equipment about four feet away from the microphone here next to the computer and uh, I haven't heard any complaints about any of the, the, the noise out of that and uh, it doesn't affect me whatsoever. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I can hear a little bit of, you know, kind of white noise, but there's no way to tell if that's the, the phone line or if that's the, the uh, system. My guess is it's probably more the phone line than anything. Uh, let's see, are there any other questions? either on Twitter or uh, within the webinar. Uh, Graham Mitchell has a couple comments that, that 4 gig fiber channel and 10 gig in Finiband is, is pretty inexpensive. Um, you know, just from kind of a, a networking and storage perspective. Anything else? Uh, if not, we can let Mark continue. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and, and keep moving forward there, Mark. All right. Um so really all I have then is uh, just a little show and tell on what we actually have. Uh, so whether you are a standard client fan or a web, web client fan, uh, we're all going to that web client. So I've, I've been trying to use this as much as possible going forward. Um, but uh, this is that uh, shuttle PC that we have. Uh, and uh, really, I mean, it's an i7. It's a, that 3.1 gigahertz is relatively good, but again, it's four cores with hyper-threading, I end up with eight logical cores. Uh, and on, a, on 32 gigs, you can run quite a big, quite a, quite a bit of workload. Uh, I'm trying to mimic a domain, uh, SQL Server, Windows Virtual Center, uh, and I've got a couple of ESX servers that are running. So uh, I've got ESX2 uh, in maintenance mode. You can see I have a cluster here of all the virtualized ESX servers running some other VMs. Um, but uh, I've got ESX2 in maintenance mode right now because uh, I went through and took advantage of something uh, in the VMware flings, which is VMware tools for nested ESXi servers. And it uh, gives you all the instructions really quick and easy on how to run an ESX server as a VM and then load up VMware tools inside of it. And the reason we want VMware tools inside of it is so we can do little things like this. and. Uh, actually go ahead and run power sequencing. It makes it much easier to manage the, uh, the home lab environment uh, as you're going ahead and uh, playing around with things. Uh, so that'll get fired up. Uh, just wanted to go ahead and show the networking aspect of things. Uh, so I'm a fan of distributed virtual switches if I'm using VMware, uh, but for the physical shuttle I still have individual networks that I've gone through and created because uh, anybody who's been in a catch-22 in uh, any environment where you can't make changes to your hosts because you're managing them with distributed virtual switches, uh, you've been in that conundrum before and uh, your management cluster should always be running uh, standard vSwitches uh, just to remove that dependency on a vCenter operating system. Um, and this, this host here should be actually rebooting or shutting down at this point. Um, 
And if you were looking to, I know uh, I was talking with the uh, the organizers earlier. Some of the other things uh, I keep I made mention to it as I ran through the presentation. The reason I go through the presentation pretty quick is you can go ahead and uh, I've got on my YouTube channel here. Uh, I've got the uh, a five video playlist on how to build this home lab, and this is detailed configurations for each of these devices: the switch, the SAN the uh, spider and uh, just a quick summary of how everything looks when it's all put together. So uh, I put all that together so you didn't have to only have a 30 minute, one hour session where you could uh, see the content. You could revisit it at your leisure as you were putting these components uh, together for yourself. Um, so I think that that'll be a big help to, to, to folks that, uh, that are interested in that. All right. Absolutely. And uh, I have a note here to uh, post the link along with the recording of this podcast on professionalvmware.com. So uh, you know, everyone can go there and, and at least get the link, if not watch the video as well. You still there, Mark? Can anybody hear me? For the record, I did not mute him. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. Is that you, John? <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's John Harris. Yeah, the slacker. Uh, no, you are you got work to do. Um, interesting. Not sure where Mark went. I reiterate, I didn't do it. <laughs> hey, I'm back. I lost the uh, hey, connectivity. Okay, cool. But uh, yeah, is there anything else? Any other questions that are out on the floor that uh, anyone wants fielding or just general discussion? I, I did want to comment on the uh, the center thing there. Where it says thank you. It says work hard once, automate everything. Love it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a regular lender just posted a link in the internal chat uh, saying that the, the Sophos home UTM platform uh, features full network web mail and web application security with VPN functionality and protects up to 50 IP addresses. Uh, and that's a, that's a free thing that you can find on Sophos.com. Pretty cool. I was not aware of that. And that's the one that plugs in the endpoint, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Does anyone know? I thought that was uh, I thought that was McAfee or something like that. I could be wrong. Ah, yeah. Both Ray and Graham are saying that it does not uh, plug in an endpoint. Uh, but that Kaspersky does. Awesome. Well, this has been a really good conversation, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for stopping in and, and talking about home labs. Does anybody have any questions for uh, either uh, Mark or myself or Josh or John? Hmm. Okay. Well, let me, uh, let me take a look at Twitter. Uh, yeah, the John Harris uh, at the BCAC guys is talking on the V Brown hashtag. Good lord, <laughs> the V Brown bag hashtag. Uh, you know, talking about the the different types of hardware that that folks use uh, within their home labs. And uh, I think that about covers it. It's a quick show tonight. Mark, did you have anything else? Well, uh, I mean, I checked my channels, so I mean, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways to, to continue these conversations, and uh, you know, we got quite a few few attendees out there. If uh, you all want to chime in, uh, you know, one of your small thoughts that you might think is insignificant could definitely help somebody out as they're building their environment together and learning. So uh, make sure to continue sharing with the community because uh, that's that's the whole point, right? Making everyone else's life easier with things you've discovered. Here, here. Indeed. Uh, Mike Marsegli has a question. Is Autolab still being developed? Uh, that is a good question, Mike. 
um, uh, yeah. pretty much all of the brown bag folks and a number of community people as well uh, uh, had contributed to Auto Lab, uh, you know, over the years. I'm not sure what the state of the current development is because uh, Vista 5.5 uh, has had a much bigger footprint in terms of memory requirements than what was needed with 5.0 and even 5.1. Uh, so, you know, the Auto Lab itself uh, had, you know, pretty much reached the point to where it wasn't very feasible to run it on a laptop. It, you know, it would actually have to run in an asset environment on an actual home lab which is still a great use case for the auto lab, uh, you know, kind of like a one-click uh, setup sort of a thing. Uh, however, my biggest, you know, and, and, and most favorite thing about it is that I could spin up an entire lab on my laptop. And, uh, you know, memory requirements and such are, are, are making that difficult. As for the actual development on it, uh, I haven't done anything on it in a while. I would need to check with Alistair Cook. Uh, or if you'd like, you can tweet him. He is at Demitas, N-Z, that's D-E-M-I-T-A-S-S-E-N-Z, -S -S -E or Z, as he likes to say, because he's silly and he comes from the other side of the world. Uh, let me make sure I got that right. Yep. Yep, that's right. Yep, that is Mr. Alistair Cook. He is the brains behind the, uh, the V brown bag, uh, and also part of the reason why we have that, that silly international number on the dial-in now, uh, because we uh, are using a New Zealand credit card to pay for the account. And, Coach webinar assumes that hey, that's the the locale of the phone number they're going to present. So, if you've been if you've been logging on and wondering why the devil we've got a New Zealand a New Zealand long distance international number there, that's why, and not able to change it. So uh, uh, I, I can wonderful things. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Uh, I I will chime in that uh, I do know that uh, Al's been working on it a bit. Uh, he sent something out to to me uh, a couple of weeks ago to kind of uh, you know, you know, beta test some uh, recent updates. So I didn't actually do that because I'm slack. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I do know he's been doing some work on it. Uh, how far along he is, I can't say. So I won't, I won't uh, commit him to anything at this point. Yeah, and uh, if you'd like to uh, contribute to the Auto Lab, uh, feel free to hit up Alistair and uh, you guys can work through, you know, how you might be able to go ahead and, and accomplish certain tasks, et cetera. Uh, yeah, there, there's fame right. and riches involved. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Uh, fat, fat cars and attractive people. Um, actually, none of those things. Well, probably the attractive people. <laughs> but uh, uh, any other questions, comments, concerns, complaints, phrases, funny jokes? Nothing. All right. Mm, no, I guess that's it. All righty. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will see you next week. Uh, I don't. I can't think of what the actual day that's going to be. What is that? March fifth, I think. Anyhow, uh, have a good week, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Yeah, thanks again. Bye bye.